Hello. I'm going to take it off screen share here. Good. Hello. How are you all? We're going to, I'm going to talk for just a minute to let everybody finish kind of checking in, but I figure I could start by giving you a little bit of an overview of what we're going to be doing and um, how this runs. So I'm going to be reading along on some of my notes throughout this talk. So if it looks like I'm not looking at you, you're right. I'm just going through some of my notes to remember some of the things I wanted to talk about. So this is a talk I often give for parents and for other educators, and it can be useful giving some really basic concepts about children and how to help them grow up to become creative adults. Some of you might be helping your kids with their education in a whole new way that you've never been doing before. Some of you might be seasoned veterans that have been homeschooling for years. Some of you might just be parents who are interested in getting a little bit more data about how to help kids or getting some new thoughts and some new ideas to consider as you work to help your kid grow up to become a creative, strong, intelligent adult. So yeah, so we're gonna look at some basic pieces of data. Here's what I want you to know. Usually when I do this talk, what I do is I spend a little bit of time showing a key piece of data and then we spend a little bit of time with the audience doing a little bit of back and forth, working on ideas of how that might be able to be applied to, if it's a group of teachers, to some of the kids that they're doing, or if it's parents, to how they can apply it as parents when they're at home with their kids or when they're working on their schoolwork with their kids. And it kind of works really well that way. So I'm gonna try to do that again with the Q&A section in this. So as we go, when I ask you for some examples, what I'd like you to do is think about them and any that you're willing to share, put in the Q&A and we'll do a little bit of back and forth uh, virtually. And hopefully it'll go really well. Does that sound all right? Okay, good. Okay, so um, first of all, I just wanna make sure you know this is intended for parents. If you're a child who's watching it, that's great. There's all kinds of things I'm sure you could take away from it, but that's not actually who I'm intending this for. So if you happen to log in and you're not a parent or you're not an educator, just know <clears throat> that's not the intended audience. If you have questions, feel free to go ahead, but I'm not actually putting this towards you. I'm putting this towards adults. It's our first time we're doing an adult webinar for the kids or for the <laughs> an adult webinar on this kind of Delphian online platform. So hopefully it goes really well. All right, um, one more kind of basic thing to know. So all of the stuff I'm gonna go over are out of this set of books. So there's this package of books called the Applied Scholastics Educators Package. And what it is, is it's a bunch of work on the educational philosophy and the study technology of L. Ron Hubbard. And it has guided much of the work that the Delphian School has done over 40 years and much of the work that Heron Books has done in creating curriculum for the Delphian School. And it's all really well captured in these books. So everything I give you is something from here that you could then apply to your children. And if you find yourself really interested and engaged and wanting to study more, these are the books to study it out of. I'm only gonna give you probably 10 paragraphs out of all of these books. So there's all kinds of really great basic fundamentals. So if you get excited and you wanna study more and know more, kind of come up with your own ideas and thoughts and have the basics to build those, these give you those. Okay, well, let's get going. So let me start by introducing myself. My name's Sam Silver. I'm a Delphian teacher for the past 20 or so years. Um, I spent almost all of my adult life as a teacher at the Delphian School. If anyone doesn't know, I assume probably most of you know who the Delphian School is, but if you don't, it was, it's a private school out on the West Coast. It was founded in 1977. It's about to hit its 45th anniversary. And the founders of the school set out to revitalize education as a positive force in society using the educational technology of L. Ron Hubbard. Their goal was to develop a growing flood of individuals who are capable of bringing sanity and leadership to their environments. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull the slides up. Mostly we'll be watching on the slides from here on out. Okay, here we go. Okay, the title of the talk, done. A picture of me. Oh yeah, I was supposed to show that while I was talking about myself. Anyway, that's me. This is Delphi. Incredibly beautiful place to work. Incredibly beautiful place to be a teacher. 
So at Delphi, there's this quote that we're kind of guides us in some everyday action. We try to live up to this, the idea put forth in this quote. So this says, an educational program which begins with the child's parents, progresses through kindergarten and grade school, through high school and into college, and preserves at every step the individuality, the native ambitions, intelligence, abilities, and dynamics of the individual is the best bastion, bastion is a defense, a wall for defense, is the best bastion against not only mediocrity, but any and all enemies of mankind. So here at the Delphian School, we're trying to put a system in that can be that for every student who enters our doors. So now I work at the Delphian School's sister organization, which is called Heron Books. Um, Heron Books is the curriculum creation team of the Delphian School. Heron and Delphian were the same group for most of those 45 years and have branched out to be two different groups because the curriculum that's been created for the Delphian School turns out a lot of other schools have wanted it. So we've created our own little publishing group where we create books for homeschoolers, other schools, etc. So people can use the curriculum that we created more broadly. All right. So the title of my talk, Helping Children Create Their Own Future. What I really want to talk about is what kind of future are we setting kids up for? Meaning, what are we doing with our children today, tomorrow, this week, this month? What are we doing with them to get them ready to create their future? So after all, they're the ones that are going to be living their future. I'm hoping that what we do today strengthens our ability to help children by giving us all a chance to step back and look at some fundamentals and then come up with some ideas of how we can use them to create a better future. Okay, so this is really important. Before I begin, I feel like I have to give you an overview of just my own personal beliefs, why I feel like this topic is so important to me. So we all come to our callings, whatever job we have, we come to it in whatever way we do. For me, um, my calling is education. Why is it education? Why is that so important to me? Well, I feel like what we do with our kids today, tomorrow, and for the years to come is going to determine what the future looks like. And the way I see it, the future of this world with all of its incredible, ever-changing, ever-increasing technological advances has two potential destinations. And I care deeply about which of those we end up having as the future of the human race. So one of those worlds could be portrayed by Star Trek. I'll get into that more. And one might be portrayed by the future envisioned in WALL-E. I don't know if you guys have seen Wally, so let me explain that one first. So this, I'm going to play this video. Come on, you can do it, computer. So Wally is this really great kids movie that envisions this future of a future human society that is completely dependent upon the machines that they have created. They're no longer able to create. They can't explore. Um, in this, they can't even move. They can't get out of their chairs. They are completely cared for by their own technology and everything is taken care of for them and they've lost their enthusiasm about exploration, about creativity. They don't really even see very far beyond, beyond the screen that's in their face. So let me see if I can figure out how to get this video playing because if you haven't seen Wally, -E, this is just a little clip that'll give you an idea of what that's like. Gosh, it's going to be no fun if I can't get these clips rolling. They usually work just fine, but I've never tried to do them through a Zoom conference. All right, well, I'll see if I can work that out. James, if you're outside watching, come on in. Let's see if we can get that technical glitch figured out. But in the meantime, you get the idea. So here is a picture. You can see these guys. They are... Uh... Come on in, James. It's okay. Hi everyone. This is James. He's my technical support. But you can see this picture. There's, you know, they have a screen in front of them. They're fed. They're told what to do, what to think. It's, it's not a future that any of us, I think, want. So the other future might be described as the Star Trek future. It's a nice symbol for it. In the Star Trek future, we have humans. Um, I'm going to try to 
I'm going to try to sort this out. I'll be back. I'll leave you with this excellent imagery here. Lovely. <laughs> so in the Star Trek future, we have a group of people who explores. They're, they're, their natural instinct is to explore. Go, go boldly where no man has gone before. They're curious. They want to know more. They're brave. They're creative. So that's two potential futures. And they're obviously not the only futures possible. But in my mind, those are the two futures I see for humans as we evolve our technology. And it gets really exciting. We either go Wally, where we are incapable of work and keep a, incapable of creation, or we go Star Trek, where we are explorers and uh, creators of our own environments. So personally, I want the Star Trek universe, and that's why I care about education. I feel like education is the way we do that. If we create a lot of humans who have the basic nature of explorer, adventurer, conquerors of environments, we'll create a future where we are assisted and enhanced by advancing technology, not owned by advancing technology. So that's the real job of educators, create young people capable of creating a future that allows humankind to be interested, to explore, and to create. I think that's what makes healthy, happy people, and I think that's what makes a better world. Okay, so if you're with me, and that's an important goal to you, how do we do that? There's a lot of answers, but today I'm gonna to focus on three fundamentals. So fundamental number one, creation of knowledge. Fundamental number two, a student's right to create, own, and solve problems. And fundamental number three, the importance of environment in a real education. Okay, let's start with fundamental number one, the creation of knowledge. So here's how we're gonna kind of move into this workshop environment, should be fun. So I'm gonna put a quote up here that has a really key basic idea. We're gonna read through it together as a group. I'll read it out loud, but obviously read it on the screen. You'll probably get more out of that. And um, then I'll give you a little drill following it, something to think about, and then we'll cover that in the Q&A quickly, and then we'll move on to the next one. Okay, so here's the first basic. The reason knowledge has been misunderstood is because what is normally thought of as knowledge is only half the answer. By definition, knowledge has been thought of as that which is perceived or learned or taken from another source. This patently, so patent means obviously or clear to see, it's easy to be seen. So this patently means that when one learns, one is being in effect. Opposed to this, we have the neglected half of existence, which is the creation of knowledge, the creation of data, the creation of thought, the causative consideration, self-evolved ideas, as opposed to ideas otherwise evolved. So you can see how we have two sides of knowledge here, right? You think that video is going to work? Okay, I'm going to try this video again so you can get a, a taste of the Wally world that's, I think we all see as a potential scary, scary potential in our future. And we're not getting it. We're just gonna move on. Hopefully by the end, I'll figure out how to show you the Star Trek video because it's really fun. Gives a really fun way to end this. All right, so here's the drill. Find an area of your life that you are good at, that you're confident in, that you're truly knowledgeable about. And then I want you to really look at what parts of that knowledge came from others and what parts of that knowledge you created yourself. If anybody wants to give an example in the q and I love it and I can read it out to the group and we'll go from there. So go ahead, do that drill. We'll take 30 seconds to a minute, think about that and we'll move on to the next thing. Okay, good. Does anybody want to put something in the Q&A? Any thoughts that they've had on it? All right, Stephanie says acting. Part came from her studies with certain teachers. Other parts came from your experience. Perfect. So if we look back at that quote, great example. The reason why, oh gosh darn it, sorry. 
So there's a neglected half of existence, which, which is the creation of knowledge. That was a perfect example. Half of it came from receiving and half of it came from creating. Dilpreet says she's good at teaching. Fabulous. So Dilpreet, I'd love to hear what part of that skill at teaching came from data you received and what part of that came from data you created yourself. Think about that. It might be an interesting way to consider, point to consider. Good, Amjad and Safiya, good at handling people to do the job. Great, again, consider what part of that came from other people's recommendations, knowledge that you received and what part of that did you create yourself? Good, Lauren, very nice. Comedy, she gave a great example of comedy and she said, it's just because I know what's gonna be funny, it's knowingness, structure of comedy that can be, that can be learned, that's fine tuning, but being funny is just what she creates herself. Beautiful, Nicole says, having a home birth. Wow, what a challenging one. You had lots of data from many sources, but until I went through and saw what worked and didn't, I then was able to have new data to pass on to others. That's perfect. Great example. A really key part when we're educating children or working with children is realizing that we have to allow them to receive the data, but then also we have to allow them to create the data themselves as well. Half and half is my thought on it. Good. Okay, good. So we're going to move on to the next thing. Thank you. Those were great answers. So the next thing, let me pull it back up. Okay, so next we're going to do this next basic. So it says study, investigation, receiving education, and similar activity are all effect activities and result in the assumption of less responsibility. If a person feels they must gather all their data from elsewhere, they are then the effect of knowledge and they tend to reduce their own ability to form, make, or create knowledge. Powerful one. Good, so we're gonna do another drill. I'm gonna leave that up for just a sec and then we'll move on to it. Here we go. Drill. Think of an example of education as an effect activity, leaving a student less responsible. Then think of several examples how you could include activities in an education that increase a student's ability to form, make, or create knowledge. Go ahead, I'll open up the Q&A and I uh, can't wait to hear what some of you come up with. You know, and this doesn't have to be education too. You could think of any time you're working with a child, how you could put them in a situation where they're becoming less responsible because they're just at the effect. They're not able to form, make, or create knowledge. All right, Stephanie says effect. A student has to regurgitate data on a test. Cause, have them come up with the questions themselves for a test. Awesome idea. Amja and Sophia says memorize a lesson and doing a project. That's such a good example. Memorizing is such an effect activity. It doesn't allow you to think what's important and what's not important. It doesn't allow you to create, this guy said this, this, and this, which led to this brilliant new thought that I had about how to combine all of those into a new thing. Well, if all you're trying to do is regurgitate it for a test, that new piece of bright idea, that new intelligent thought doesn't have anything to do with anything because it doesn't do it with a test. But if you're doing a project, that bright thought goes somewhere and helps you get that project done and helps you be more effective. Dilpreet said, ask the student to use a dictionary. That's a great idea. That puts them at a cause point. Great. Okay, good. Good examples. Let's move on to the next one. So people who can create knowledge are in high demand in the world today. I think that's not not really something that we can question or we really have to explain in too much detail, but if you think about who you would wanna hire in a business, it's not necessarily somebody who just can follow orders. It's somebody who you can give an idea. I would like this thing to get done and they can create ideas of how to get that done. Who can go find, they can research on the internet, in books, ask people and then come up with their own ideas of how to do something well and they don't need to be told how to do everything. Right? That's a creation of data or a creation of knowledge. And the people who really create knowledge, the Steve Jobs, the 
the founders of Google, Facebook, um, authors. These are people that are completely changing the face of the future by creating knowledge, right? So people who can create knowledge are in high demand and creators of knowledge are the creators of the future. So through education, we should be trying to create individuals that can create knowledge and aren't waiting to just receive knowledge from other sources. It's a good goal, right? So that brings us to the second fundamental, which is problems. So a student's right to create, own, and solve problems. What's most fundamentally true to me about life and about young people? And <laughs> you're gonna laugh at this, don't laugh, let me explain it, but people, especially young people and learners need problems. More specifically, all people working towards adulthood have the right to create and own and solve problems. We're fighting an uphill battle on this one right now. I'm from the state of Oregon and in the US, did you know, oh, sorry, I'm from the state of Oregon. James has an update on our, uh, our videos. Okay, if you wanna watch the Wally video, we can do it. Let's, let's test James, we'll see. We're gonna skip all the way to the end. Do, do, do. All right, so this is the Wally world. You gave me a problem. I gave him a problem. There's a man that can solve a problem. Uh, I don't know if you get any audio here. Let's see if we can figure out how to get any audio. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Anyway, you get the idea. You can see these guys, there's not a lot of ability to create here, right? They're owned by their future. You see this with kids walking around with their cell phones, right? Not just kids, with me. I'm walking around like this and my attention never makes it very far past right here. It's a horrifying idea of what the future could lead to. So that's the Wally one. All right, so we go back. Thanks, James. James, we're gonna need sound for sure. So feel free to come on in because we're about to get to my favorite part of this. All right. So students have the right to own, create, and solve problems. Very important. So we're fighting an uphill battle on this one, so it's gonna give you some examples. Did you know that in my state, in Oregon, if a kid is under 16, he's not allowed to climb a ladder? Not joking. Use a pressure washer. He's not allowed to use a pizza oven. He's not allowed to wash a truck or do sign waving. I'm not joking. Here's where I got these. This is actually from the state of Oregon, Summary of child labor laws. I just pulled those out of there. So um, it's a problem. It's a real problem. So we have to protect a student's right to create, own, and solve problems. More and more we hear, hear about parents who own all the problems for their children. Examples of this could be probably many of you remember the scandal where people were paying, parents were paying for their college, their kids to get college prep test scores or to get college acceptances. It was a huge scandal a couple of years ago. Several celebrities were arrested. Um, or you get adults doing their kids' homework. Seems ridiculous. It happens all the time. It's all over the place. Um, there's a million examples. Of this. I think I give this talk all the time. It's something that's always on my mind. And I find myself constantly messing up on this where my kid wants to get into the truck and they are like climbing into the truck and I pick them up and put them in the truck. But they wanted to climb in that truck. They wanted to figure out where do I put my hand and how do I do this? You know, little stuff like that. It's everywhere where we take the problem and we don't let them own the problem and solve the problem. And it's not actually good for them. So, sorry, I got a little off script. Let me see where we are. The ability for a child to have a problem is dwindling day by day. And the answers in here represent a refuge for students to have the right to own and solve problems. And what we do as parents represent a huge opportunity for our children to actually own and solve a problem if we can recognize that that is needed. So don't underestimate what that means for your kid. Don't underestimate what that means for the future. I ran across this TED talk that I thought just absolutely nailed it. So this is the Dean of Freshmen at Stanford. 
she found more and more that her incoming students just were unable completely to stand on her own two feet. So I'm gonna put it on, we're having some trouble with sound. So I'm actually gonna put it on, I'm gonna put the sound on on my computer right over here. So give me a moment to pull this up. If it doesn't sync up exactly, don't worry about it. Just try to listen well to the sound. And um, what she has to say is really powerful. So just hang tight while I get this set up. James, I think what it is probably is the mic is the input sound. So we're hitting a new, it's a new phase of technology that we just haven't dealt with yet. So sorry about that. Hang in there with us, we'll make it work so it at least works at a basic level. All right, here we go. You know, I didn't set out to be a parenting act. See if I can sync them up just a little bit better. And expert. In fact, I'm not very interested in parenting per se. It's just that there's a certain style of parenting these days that is kind of messing up kids, impeding their chances to develop into their selves. There's a certain style of parenting these days that's getting in the way. I guess what I'm saying is we spend a lot of time being very concerned about parents who aren't involved enough in the lives of their kids and their education or their upbringing, and rightly so. But at the other end of the spectrum, there's a lot of harm going on there as well. Where parents feel a kid can't be successful unless the parent is protecting and preventing at every turn and hovering over every happening and micromanaging every moment and steering their kid towards some small subset of colleges and careers. When we raise kids this way, and I'll say we, because Lord knows in raising my two teenagers, I've had these tendencies myself, our kids end up leading a kind of checklisted childhood. And here's what the checklisted childhood looks like. We keep them safe and sound and fed and watered. And then we wanna be sure they go to the right schools, but not just that, that they're in the right classes at the right schools, and that they get the right grades in the right classes in the right schools. But not just the grades, the scores. And not just the grades and scores, but the accolades and the awards and the sports and the activities and the leadership. We tell our kids, don't just join a club, start a club, because colleges wanna see that and check the box for community service. I mean, show the colleges you care about others. <laughs> and all of this is done to some hope for degree of perfection and act like our kids concierge and personal handler and secretary. And then with our kids, our precious kids, we spend so much time nudging, cajoling, hinting, helping, haggling, nagging as the case may be, to be sure they're not screwing up, not closing doors, not ruining their future. And here's what it feels like to be a kid in this checklisted childhood. First of all, there's no time for free play. There's no room in the afternoons because everything has to be enriching, we think. It's as if every piece of homework, every quiz, every activity is a make or break moment for this future we have in mind for them. And we absolve them of helping out around the house. And we even absolve them of getting enough sleep as long as they're checking off the items on their checklist. Checklisted childhood, pretty powerful phrase, right? So, um, so we've heard of helicopter parenting. Well, it's old news now. Like a good strong virus, helicopter parenting has evolved. Now we have something called snowplow parenting. Here's an excerpt from a New York Times article, snowplow parenting. Helicopter parenting, the practice of hovering anxiously near one's children, monitoring their every activity is so 20th century. Some affluent mothers and fathers now are more like snowplows, machines chugging ahead, clearing any obstacles in their child's path to success. So they don't have to encounter failure, frustration, or lost opportunities. 
keywords right there. So they don't have to encounter failure, frustration, or lost opportunities. All right, well, we have a problem, right? So let's look at some basics on this, starting with why it's so important that we help students increase their ability to create problems. A person begins to take care of the future by imagining what is going to happen so as to be ready for it. He or she tries to foresee through imagination possible problems that will be met and to reach conclusions about them so that split second action can take place when the actual problem is met. To accurately assess a situation, it's necessary to be capable of imagining what is going to happen. So what do we mean by creating problems? We, we mean Steve Jobs. Look at all the problems he created. First, how do you manufacture a mini computer that can fit in your pocket and take phone calls? Following that, how do we create mobile internet service that can service the capability of a smartphone? How do we create instant access to products via a smartphone? How do you make batteries that can last long enough to handle what a smartphone demands? It goes on and on and on. Creation of problems. Well, students and young people should be imagining futures and creating problems at mad rates. A great example of an educational environment supporting that is a project a student took on here at the school she decided that the school needed its own film festival. We've never had a film festival before and she decided it's time. So that created a lot of problems for her. And actually it created a lot of problems for other students throughout the school. And so she made it happen. She solved the problems and it was a huge success. Here's what she had to say after she finished that project. She said, the film festival gave me the chance to create and lead an activity that has never been attempted before. I was able to support and help the artists here at Delphi to accomplish producing films they were excited about and have the chance to showcase them for the student body and the staff members. It was a very challenging project for me and I feel I grew a lot from experiencing a bit of the production world I want to be a prominent person in. So as you can see, this is a girl who created a whole bunch of problems and for herself and for other staff. And actually it was part of the program that goes on at the Delphian School. That was one of the projects she did as one of about 20 similar required projects done at Delphi. So that was her idea of how to come up with, how to fulfill that aspect of the program. So that's just one of the ways we do it here is we have a structure that demands some creation of problems. All right, so here's the drill. Think of some examples of way you can defend a child's right to create, own, and solve problems. Then consider how this might protect that child's native drive to foresee possible problems and to reach conclusions about them. We're gonna do this pretty quick because we're actually starting to run low on time already. So go ahead, think it up. If anybody puts anything in the Q&A, fabulous. If not, we'll give you a chance to just kind of consider. About 10 more seconds and we'll move on. Okay, good, we're gonna move on. So next slide, here's another great basic on this. Dependency versus self-determinism. This is the conflict of the child and the conflict of the student, not to mention the adult, the soldier, the president, the king. The way a person becomes less self-determined is becoming dependent. If a person has become dependent, he or she has essentially abandoned control of an area. Mind you, dependency is not all bad. It could be considered that a 50% dependency would represent optimum action. Dependency uncontrolled, misunderstood, or not understood by the individual, however, is thoroughly bad. In trying to bring out full self-determinism in a student, sorry, my screen is over this line, dependency can be an enemy to that self-determinism. If you take the level of determinism of individuals who have been corrected a great deal, the need for correction representing a dependency on another, and the level of determinism of an individual who hasn't, of individuals who haven't been corrected a great deal, you'll find out you have two entirely different levels. You'll find that the individual who hasn't been corrected much will have a much higher level of self-determinism. Really fascinating quote. So let's talk about this for a minute. What is happening each time we step in and we solve a problem for a child? What are we doing to that child's solution of the problem? He's working to solve that problem and we're correcting it, right? Well, if we wanna create, sorry, this is the pain of having taken my computer off mute. Um, 
All right, moving on. All right, well, if we want to create independent students who can create their future, we better pay attention to this key basic. As an important note from 20 years of experience working with students, a child's solution is often many things, ranging from brilliant to maybe different, maybe to unique. Sometimes you might be really nice and call it rather uninformed. But when you give them a chance to create and implement their own solutions, you and they might not only discover how able they really are, but you might just be surprised at the ingenuity and the effectiveness of the solution they came up with. And it might actually be better than what you would have come up with yourself. It's a fascinating thing. You just gotta let them go sometimes. Okay, let's do another drill. We'll do this really quick. Think of a couple examples of ways you could lower a child's self-determinism by not allowing them the right to solve a problem in their life. Then let's just do one. Think of an example of a way you could increase self-determinism in a child by allowing them to create and implement their own solution to a problem. I'll take one answer if anybody wants to put it into the Q&A. Yeah, so I got an interesting one, not to let them jump from a higher place for fun. So that's interesting because you got to protect their safety, right? But you also are trying not to correct their solution to the problem. So there's, there's definitely a balance there. Somebody said doing their Lego set for them. That's a way you could steal that self-determinism. Great example. Okay, good. We're going to move on. Really nice examples. So, um, Sorry, we'll leave it there. So a huge part of this is children have to have the right to fail and recover. It's an easy mistake for parents and educators to get out in front, ensure the road's free of obstacles. But by doing that, we rob the students of the growth that's associated with failing and discovering firsthand what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are, what are they sharp at, what are they really, really good at, what are they really struggle with. And that only comes from trying things, from failing, from coming up with your own solutions to problems. And, you cannot, you cannot rob that from your students. There's a great example of this that I love. So last year in college basketball, I love college basketball, the team that won the championship um, had this horrible defeat the year before. So most of you guys probably have heard of March Madness. So it's this college basketball tournament, the best teams play the worst teams, very simple description, not exactly right, but pretty true. So in the history of the college basketball tournament, the best team had never lost to the worst team. It had never happened. And then two years ago, the best team lost. And they lost bad. They lost by like 20 points. And I kept listening to this. And okay, so they lost really bad. Then the next year, they came back and won the whole championship. For the first time in like 40 years of history of their school, they won the thing. So I kept, I got kind of obsessed with this coach. He was a really fascinating guy. And I kept listening to interviews. And he kept using this really interesting phrase and saying this really interesting line. So he kept calling that gift, or sorry, that loss, the embarrassing, awful loss, never had happened before. He kept calling it their painful gift. And he said this line about adversity. He said, if you learn to use it right, the adversity, it will buy you a ticket to a place you couldn't have gone any other way. Well, snowplow parenting, helicopter parenting, taking problems and solving them for your own kids when they could solve them themselves, that robs students of that painful gift. You can't learn these things if you never get to test your own conclusions and try your own ideas. All right, here's another basic I really love. In order to survive, an organism must be more than an object. It must have the force of life in it. It must be a causative agent. Individuals who can reason can change their environment. If they cannot reason, they cannot change their environment. As a final note on that one, I consider one of the best bits of advice I ever give to any student is go find a project that scares you. Go sign up for the thing that you think there's no way you could ever succeed at. Sign up for it. Fail or succeed, you're going to learn a lot and you're going to be more capable at the end of it than you were at the start. All right, on to fundamental number three. Oh, we have this drill. I'm just going to skip it as we're running pretty low on time. Um, yeah, let's just move on. Fundamental three, I'm gonna go right to it. So the importance of environment in a real education. Environment is another grossly overlooked factor in contemporary education, since environment is the one thing which can give data a proper weight. Many a navigator can sail the devil out of a ship in a classroom and get lost trying to find the end of a pier. 
Education, which is done strictly against academic background, is stultifying. That means it loses your interest, makes you feel you've lost life. And most of its importance is lost because it has not exercised the person's mind in waiting and deriving. So this one's pretty clear, but it's often overlooked and it can be really hard to do. It's one of the things that we're really lucky to have at Delphi is we have this huge campus, huge hill. We have great relationships with professionals from our alumni association and from our local environment. But you've got to get kids out into practical activities that include the problems of real life. That provides environment. It can be made up of things like the project that that student did before where she put on a whole film festival. That's a student interested in going into the film industry. She created some environment for herself. And luckily for us, we have a program that kind of supported that. It's a lot harder to do from at home, but you have to find ways, professional firms that you can get your kids internships to, or real world activities like building a bridge over a pond. Huge, huge way to give your kids environment, those kind of things. Even just allowing your child to participate in family duties, like doing chores at home. All of that gives kids an environment that allows their education to mean something. So you have to find ways to do it. The possible ways are infinite, um, but don't forget to do that when you're working with your kids. All right, so we're gonna skip this next drill. We're gonna go to this last thing that I really love. So there are some axioms of education given by Mr. Hubbard, and I pulled out two of them because I felt they really relate to this. In education, a datum is as important as it contributes to the solution of problems. Problems and solutions are as important as they are related to survival. So I just wanted to note on this that a real environment has real problems and it has real solutions. It has failures, it has successes, but these rightly belong to the child. What's a snowplow parent doing? To be very simple, they're just robbing their child of an environment and that's education and childhood at effect. So I think you get the point. Watch out, it's so easy to do. We all do it in more ways than we think. I talk about this all the time and professionally, I'm paid to not do this and I do it with my kids all the time. So just keep an eye out for it. It's really, it's, it's really powerful if you can get going on this. So there's this final drill, I'm gonna skip that because what I wanna do is I wanna propose that this modern world has a basic professional environment and that environment is what every kid is getting themselves ready for. And the environment is rapid change. It's creation of knowledge. It's creating and solving problems. That is the environment of the future. More and more every day, that's becoming the environment. So remember I talked about my own personal purpose for education and wanting to create a Star Trek future, not a Wally future? Well, I want you to watch a couple of short clips and just think about the basics we talked about today. So think about creation of data, creating and solving problems, and what environment in education creates. Are you ready? Okay, so first we're gonna watch that Wally World video again. All right. Hi again, everyone. James is here, tech support. All right, allow me here. Oh, you think you figured it out? I think so. Let's try it. Let's try this. Let's go same as system, I bet. Oh, whatever, James knows what he's doing. No, James doesn't. The system. Let's just play the, the audio from here. Let's do that. <laughs> we haven't, I haven't tried <laughs> to play a YouTube video through a slide on a Zoom call before. You know, yeah. real environment, real problem. I'm creating a problem for James. I love it. All right, here's the Wally world. Remember, what data are they creating? What environment do they have? Are they really allowed to solve and own problems of any sort? Sync them up a little bit here. And I think we missed it. I don't know what's going on. Guys. Oh, I'm no. so sorry. Sorry, people. Well, finish watching, get that idea. You can see. Things that they're saying, they're like, today's color is red. The temperature today is 72. It's what you like. Anyway, it's pretty awful. All right, here's Star Trek. So look at this potential idea of the future. Think of how many problems are these guys solving? How many problems are they creating? 
What's their confidence in being able to solve problems and create knowledge? Here we go. <laughs> we are really We'll get it. Here. Are you ready? <laughs> One, two, three. Yeah. Fancy. What the heck? This is a long, long video. What the heck is going on here? Super weird. Well, I'm so sorry. It's super fun to watch this, but it's just not working right. You can watch the video. You won't get the sound. James and I could try and do a little. That's right. A little sound. Oh, oh, jeez. Oh no, I'm falling. Uh, what should I do? I'll just jump off the edge of this cliff because I can solve all the problems that'll come up. Save me. No problem. Let's work together to solve the situation. <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to do, but we'll figure, I'll it, figure out. it out. All right. All right. Beam me we're... up, Scotty. <laughs> no, really. Beam me up now. Hurry up. Oh, I got a parachute. Oh, no, I don't. <laughs> Better figure out a new solution to this problem. Though. Quick, I'm solve about a problem. To smash into the ground and die. Let's ah! apply our knowledge to the situation. I can do it. I'll try this. Beep, 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 beep. Oh, I know what to do, but I have to run to the other room. Ah! <laughs> oh, beep, 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 beep. Watch out. I have an idea. I can I'm do going that. to solve a problem. That. Yeah, it is. That's what he says. I can do that. I can do that. Dig, 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 dig. Anyway. You and I will be able to work together like these fellows here <laughs> to solve this before your next yeah. Hopefully by Thursday webinar, we you, you're, it out. you're doing we another one on a problem. Thursday. Yeah. yeah. What? Yeah. Anyway, kind of a fun thought. So he says, "Yeah, me all," and these guys go, "Oh, thank you." So. Two different potential futures. And I think what we do today really makes a big difference on what future it's gonna be. And I think how we deal with our children is, is gonna be what we do to create that pro or to create that future. So I hope you're with me. I hope you can join me in the idea that we're gonna let children own their own problems. We're gonna demand of children that they create their own data, that they don't just receive. We're gonna allow children to come up with solutions. We're gonna allow children to fail and succeed and fail again and grow from all those experiences. I think if we do that, we can create a future where technology is owned by us and where the future is unbelievably bright and exciting. I hope you're all with me. Thank you very much. That's all we have for today. Um, just to remind you, so if you are, if you wanna do some further study, here is a little link you can go to. Sorry for all the ugly slides, but if you scan this with your phone, that'll get you there. Or you can go to heronbooks.com and you can look for the Applied Scholastics Educator Package. It looks like this, it's full of things. And because you attended this webinar, you've qualified for 30% off at anything you want from heronbooks.com, just as a thank you for coming. And hopefully, part of what we're hoping is that you spread the word and tell people about some of what's going on that the Delphian School and some of uh, what's available at Heron Books because we want to spread the word to more and more people because we think what we're doing is a little bit different and we think it can help kids. So spread the word, buy as many books as you want, 30% off on this promo code that'll be up and available for a week or so. And uh, thank you very much for coming. I hope you learned something. It was a real pleasure getting to work with you guys even though we're all from afar. <laughs>